Coming up on Nebraska Stories, a new warship named Omaha. Tom Osborne's turning point, bringing old organs back to life and finding inspiration in a hero from the past. Along the Gulf Coast, in the historic waters of Mobile Bay, sits the USS Alabama. Now a museum, the World War II era battleship was built to fight the war of her time. In the 80 years since her commissioning, war at sea has changed. Just a stone's throw away from this legacy ship is Austell, USA, a shipyard located at the mouth of the Mobile River in Mobile, Alabama. Austell is building the most recent evolution of warship for the United States Navy, including the fourth vessel to carry the name Omaha. The first ship, named after the largest city in Nebraska, was a sloop of war and was outfitted with the latest technology of 1867, a steam engine. The next Omaha was a light cruiser, commissioned in 1918. It remained in service through World War II. In 1973, during the Cold War, came the third Omaha, a nuclear-powered fast attack submarine. Now comes LCS-12, a state-of-the-art littoral combat ship. It is the fourth naval vessel to proudly bear the name United States Ship Omaha. By Navy tradition, every United States ship has a sponsor. The Secretary of the Navy called me up one day. I had no idea why he was calling. Never talked to the Secretary of the Navy before. Uh, and he asked me if I would be the sponsor. A great thing to be asked to do. And then I looked it up to see what it really meant. And when you look at the list of past ship sponsors, it's a pretty impressive list. Philanthropist Susie Buffett was selected to be the ship sponsor by the Secretary of the Navy. She will not only participate in the ship's ceremonial milestones, but also foster a relationship between the crew and the city of Omaha. As ship sponsor, Susie Buffett became an official USS Omaha crew member, and her first responsibility was christening the ship. It's a lot harder than people think it is, uh, it doesn't always crack on the first whack, but it did this time. For the United States of America, I christen the Omaha. May God bless this ship and all who sail in her. I was just so relieved. It took me, you know, about 30 seconds to get past that feeling. <laughs> the music plays, the confetti flies, you know, it's great. We went through the shipyard where they're building other LCS ships. You can see them in pieces. They're almost like Legos, the way they build them and put them together. It totally reminds you of Star Trek when you're in there. It's really cool. LCS stands for Littoral Combat Ship, and there are two variants in production. The Freedom Class, featuring a single hull, and the Independence Class, such as the Omaha, with a trimaran hull. LCS was built to operate in shallow waters to fight counterinsurgents who use 21st century terrorism tactics rather than conventional methods of war. Our survivability is based on speed and stealth. We're designed to go alone and unafraid into the littorals. The littoral environment is really by definition anything within 250 feet of water and shallower. At one third the weight of steel, Omaha is made from aluminum and outfitted with high-powered water jets rather than a traditional rudder and propeller. Omaha can exceed 40 knots, or about 50 miles an hour. It's been described as a weaponized jet ski. One of the other unique things about LCS is that it was meant to be multi-role. 
So right now there's three different warfare modules, uh, surface warfare, anti-submarine warfare, and, uh, and mine warfare. The break from traditional ship design includes the bridge, which has been compared to the USS Enterprise from the popular science fiction franchise, Star Trek. The LCS bridge is like a command center and an aircraft cockpit where you literally only have a junior officer of the deck and an officer of the deck to drive the ship, just like a pilot and a co-pilot in an aircraft. And then right behind them, unlike any other ship in the Navy, is the combat information center. And as the commanding officer, that's incredibly important for me because then I can move back and forth between them and facilitate that communication flow and more effectively employ the ship. A cutting edge vessel, the LCS, is a bold exodus from traditional Navy ship design. And it's not unusual for new ideas to experience complications. Cost overruns, design and construction problems, concerns over training and survivability are issues that continue to be improved upon. A ship is an incredibly complex machine. They have a lot of moving parts, they have a lot of instrumentation. And remember, we're only the sixth ship to come online in the independence class, so not many around yet. We discover new things that need correction on them. Not that they're bad or wrong, it's just that they could be done better, and so we go back and we fix those things, and then we move forward. I mean, LCS-12, the USS Omaha, is a beautiful ship and, and absolutely amazing in every aspect, including her crew. The United States Navy granted Nebraska stories behind-the-scenes access to the Omaha and her crew. The crew is really what makes it all work. You can build the greatest ship in the world, but if you don't have a good crew to operate it, uh, then you're not going to get very far. And uh, Omaha's crew is outstanding. Most of the sailors on Omaha have been attached to other ships. To be considered for duty on an LCS, sailors went through a rigorous application process. You always try to push yourself to do something different. Go, out, go outside your comfort zone. My comfort zone was a ground fighter, you know, doing that side of the house. And now to pre-com one of the, the newest ships in the, uh, in the Navy was uh, another challenge that I wanted to get involved in. Magazine, chamber, safety, current safe. They're professional, they're competent, they're highly educated. So when I came in the Navy, uh, very few uh, enlisted sailors had college degrees, very few. Uh, sailors, more often than not now, today coming in the Navy, have at least an associate's degree. That education, coupled with ongoing training and smart technology, is what is making it possible for a crew of 70 to operate this warship. Also a deck, topside rover, properly by BM1 Brave Boy. One of the major differences between what we do with an LCS mm -hmm. and what conventional sailors do on a ship, um, because of our small numbers, you're a lot less pigeonholed. You, you, you don't, you're not just relied on for one thing. Um, you're, you're relied on for multiple things. Besides being the weapons officer for the gunner's mates, I am also the visit board search and seizure officer. the ship's navigator. So my other jobs, uh, navigator, training officer, SAR officer, aviation coordinator, search and rescue officer, um, I think that's it right now. But yeah, it's a lot of different things. I've seen what 70% of the world looks like, and it's flat and blue as far as you can see, so. <laughs> really powerful. Hi, LS3. Going, Doc. I'm here for my uh, physical health assessment. We know each other's job. It doesn't matter just because I'm a corpsman. That doesn't mean that I don't know DC damage control or uh, operation or culinary specialist, the food. So some days you will see me in the galley cooking, right? Because it's a family. They're, they're multitasking and multitasked and multi job sailors. And that's 
very much unlike any other ships in the Navy. They're learning something new every day on the ship, and they absolutely love it, and being able to branch out outside of their normal rating boundaries. You're not doing anything wrong. I just want you to think about the hose, what you got, and everything that you can be doing with that. I think what is, what's been so successful is the fact that we are so small. Open and bail! And there, there is inherently the, the vested interest in one another. We uh we're one big family. And it's that sense of family Susie Buffett is embracing through her role as ship sponsor. Everybody who's been involved in this really cares a lot about uh, the crew and their families being connected to Omaha, you know, really for the life of the ship. There's a lot that can happen where we can stay connected. This past summer, Commander Toth and Command Senior Chief Roll paid a brief visit to the city of Omaha where they met community leaders. Well, I'm so happy to meet you, and we're so honored to have you in our city today. I did look to see if I could bring her up to, up to Omaha for commissioning, but it wasn't going to work. <laughs> well, what I'm going to tell my crew is, is that they have a tremendous city and citizens standing behind them. Congratulate you. Thank you. I appreciate the fact of coming here and how supportive <laughs> the citizens of Omaha are of the military. These people are going out there and doing something really, really important and special while the rest of us get to live our lives because they're out there doing what they're doing. You know, our ship is, is the fourth to hold the namesake of Omaha. For me, that says a lot about our namesake, about the, the city of Omaha, that it's uh, continued to be selected to be worn on a naval ship. And I know that is a huge source of pride for our crew. I didn't plan to ever be a coach, and uh, I don't know why, I just never, but I, I, do, I do know that athletics was certainly a big part of my life and something that was very important to me. So your itch has been scratched at this point in the National Football League. You know you could play at that level. You come back to Nebraska, and you're at a bit of a crossroads. You start coaching, you're not making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. What was the decision like for you to decide, all right, I could teach, I could coach. Why did you stay on the coaching path as opposed to going down the teaching road? So I came back to Nebraska in January of 1962 and uh, enrolled in the graduate program. And, and uh, it was sort of fortuitous in that Bob Devaney was hired at that same time. And I think Bob was still at Wyoming, but had been hired at Nebraska. I remember writing him a letter telling him that I would like to uh, possibly be a graduate assistant because athletics had been such a big part of my life that I thought that maybe I would somehow ease my way out of athletics. He wrote me a letter and said, well, come in and see me when I get to Lincoln. So I went in to see him and said, well, he really had probably enough coaches and wasn't sure he really needed me to coach. We said he had some kids over in Selleck Quadrangle that he understood were causing some trouble. And he wanted to know if I would move in with those kids and uh, kind of ride herd on them. He said, if you will do that, he said, I'll pay your room and board. And I said, well, okay. So I, I moved in with these guys and uh, I guess Bob liked what I had done. So he told me that spring to come out and help with spring football. and. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, I started teaching classes at the university. I had four, four ed psych undergraduate classes I was teaching. I had met Nancy in actually January of 1962 when I first came back. We got married that summer. So I was married, and uh, for that reason, I moved out of the dorm. <laughs> and uh, Good decision. <laughs> and, uh, it was much better. When I had married Nancy, I, she was 
under the impression that she was going to marry a professor <laughs> and that I'd be home every night. And uh, she'd live a fairly nice life. And uh, But I, I found that I just, the one thing that I couldn't give up was football. Uh, for some reason, it was in my blood to the degree where I couldn't walk away. Fighting the clock, the dandy Duda tosses a clutch fourth and 13 pass to Freeman White, who makes a great catch for the first down. You no, know, Bob had turned the program around in 1962. I think the preceding year in 61, they'd won three games and lost six. And, uh, and all of a sudden they go nine and two and uh, win the bowl game against Miami in the Gotham Bowl, which was soon to be defunct. And, uh, but, um, and then we won four straight Big Eight championships, beat Oklahoma. And uh, you know, Bob was riding high and the staff was riding high and uh, Bob could do no wrong. And um, then we had 67 and 68, six and four and 67 wasn't greeted with great um, acceptance, but it was kind of like, well, okay. The 68 was different. On the next play, the Huskers fumbled. Things really unraveled at that point. There was uh, some outcry that uh, Either Bob ought to go or some assistants ought to go. And uh, Bob said that uh, if one guy goes, we all go. It's kind of strange because um, probably during those 20 odd years between the Rose Bowl team in 1940 and uh, Bob's arrival in 62, a six and four season would have been a pretty good year. Most of those years, I think there were only two winning seasons in 20 years and no conference championships of any kind. And then all of a sudden, I guess the thing that I learned was that uh, once people taste a little bit of success, that uh, that immediately becomes the standard and uh, anything less becomes very bad. I was kind of interested in what was gonna happen here. And uh, when he said, uh, if, one, if one guy goes, we all go. Um, that meant a lot to me. And uh, so I was always very loyal to Bob Devaney. In a metal barn on a small hill in Denton, Nebraska, population 205, Norm Porath is giving old organs new life. This was the chapel organ. It came from Beatrice, I think, yeah. And date on this one, I think is 1895. But again, that's uh, off in the future. That's Porath is 81 years old and a retired Lutheran pastor. He's got some time on his hands. It was almost by accident his wife's niece stumbled onto an old, broken down pump organ in a vacant farmhouse. She wanted to know if we want it. Of course, you know, hey, I, I got nothing to do. I'm 81 years old. Uh, what else does a guy do, uh, you know, besides occasional substitute preaching? That's where it started in November of 2016. Since then, he's taken on a few more projects. He's on his sixth organ restoration and knows all about bellows, stop knobs, stock boards, where the sub bass is, and the all-important metal reeds that help the organ make sound. They each have to be carefully cleaned. This is the tongue on the reed. Uh, and dust gets between the tongue and this outer part of the, part of the reed. And uh, when dust is there, it doesn't play well. It takes some time for Porath to clean out years of dust, soot, and insects. Some of these instruments have been sitting in basements, storage rooms, and garages for decades. When that's done, he's ready to make music, sort of. That's the sound of a, of a, of a reed when things are working properly. and. Uh, and of course, those reeds go silent if there's worms laying on them. 
He didn't know much about pump organs before he started on his first project, but says the repairs are actually pretty simple. He gets some of his knowledge from the internet and figures out the rest on his own. And dust on it. Somebody who wants to work on a project like this, you gotta remember how it came apart. You know, because hey, all of these things were assembled and they were assembled from parts. You know, you just gotta remember the order. Uh, it's sort of like disasse disassembling an auto engine. Uh, if you disassemble it, it's a piece of cake to put it back together, as long as you do it right. Let me take this off. These instruments don't run on electricity like modern organs do. There are no complicated computer chips or special effects. They're powered completely by the pumping action and the bellows inside. The stops activate the sound. It's an old but reliable way to make music. When you pull this, it opens that valve. And when you use, and you see it's an octave, uh, and you actuate a key, uh, and when, and that thing, you know, you, if you close that valve, it quits. Um, Most of these pump organs were made more than 100 years ago, and there isn't much of a market for them anymore, and good luck finding parts. But Porth can't resist a new project. They keep coming. It usually takes him a couple of weeks to clean and repair a pump organ and get it back into playing shape. They come out of the woodwork in terms of, uh, well, I've got one, you know, you want it? Uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of these instruments are simply headed for the landfill. I don't, and I don't want that ever to happen. You know, I'll, I'll keep on taking them uh, until uh, until uh, I'm done. And uh, and of course, at 81, uh, that might not be too many years away. But anyway, hey, I I, I get a this is a hoot of a job. There's cracks. As he collects more organs for repairs, he's hoping some of his 13 grandchildren will want them. If not, he'll find new homes for the old instruments. One old organ has already found a home, his home. His wife, Kathy, is the family organist. Hey, hey, hey it's the top of the chart. <laughs> when I get done with these, you know, I'm gonna look for more, you know, uh, or maybe I'll find a different project. Maybe I'll fix lawnmowers, but uh, for now, this is, this is the thing that I really, really get a kick out of. No matter who you are, everybody needs a role model. As a Native American woman, I admire activist Winona LaDuke, filmmaker Valerie Redhorse, attorney Donnell Smith, and police officer Darla Black. Even better, I've discovered a leader from my own tribe, a woman who lived over a hundred years ago. Suzette LaFleche was the first Native woman to speak to national audiences about Indian rights. My name is Princella Parker, and I'm a member of the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska. For my mother, Alicia Parker, the Omaha Reservation was home. I was her first child. She had me at the age of 15. She wanted me and my younger siblings to grow up differently than she had, away from the negative influences on the reservation. So we moved, a lot. But we were still poor. We took a taxi to get groceries, we went to food pantries, and lived in homeless shelters. This is how I identified being Native American, being Omaha. I discovered Suzette LaFleche while working as associate producer on a PBS documentary about the Ponca Chief Standing Bear. Suzette went on a human rights crusade with Standing Bear to raise awareness in America about basic Indian rights. She'd witnessed firsthand the exile of her Ponca relatives as they were forced from their Nebraska homeland 600 miles south to Indian territory. 
Casey Camp Hornick talks about the Ponca Trail of Tears. It was our Holocaust. It was our march to the concentration camps that the United States government had created, and, and we knew it, and we knew our way of life was gone. Suzette and her family gave shelter to Standing Bear after he defied the government by leaving Indian Territory and walking back to Nebraska. Suzette was there to help when he was arrested and had to go on trial for his freedom. Standing Bear won the right to be recognized as a person in the eyes of the law. This was Suzette's first taste of Indian justice. Uh, she wasn't a person to sit back where social issues were concerned, you know. She, she wanted to know, she wanted to get involved, and, and um, maybe she was one of the first Indian feminists that <laughs> stuck her neck out and, and did what she was supposed to do. After the trial, Suzette stepped into the national spotlight when she went on a speaking tour with Standing Bear. She started off as a very, as a very timid, a very shy, a very meek personality, a very tiny woman who suddenly was on stage looking at hundreds of strangers and was overwhelmed by it. The more she did it, the more confident she got, the better she got, and by the time uh, they hit uh, the East Coast, uh, before long, she was very comfortable, and she, she became very passionate about the cause. At the age of 25, the same age I am now, Suzette became nationally known as an advocate for Indian rights. Just like a modern-day Facebook, Suzette's autograph book filled up with signatures and messages from famous Americans she met on tour. They called her Bright Eyes from her Omaha name. Learning about Suzette's life has inspired me. When I drive through the reservation where my mother grew up, I feel a need to help. I want to bring awareness and pride to the Omaha people. My dream is for Native children to be able to see positive reflections of themselves in media. As the eldest daughter of my family, I try to set a good example for my siblings, just like Suzette did for her family. Her youngest sister, Susan, went on to become the first Native American woman doctor. Dr. Susan Picot has been nominated to the Nebraska Hall of Fame. Chief Standing Bear and Bright Eyes are already there. To see more Nebraska stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund. <laughs>